Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of the OMI's Collaborative Series. Once again, I'm Rich Fagler, still Rich Fagler, <laughs> and the MC for today's event. Uh, we will start today with a presentation from Dr. Richard Griffith, Executive Director of the Institute for Cross-Cultural Management at the Florida Institute of Technology. His presentation today will be on the diversity and inclusion and cross-cultural management. Dr. Griffith. So on 11 April 86, I enlisted in the United States Army and found myself in McClellan, Alabama. I'll get a hua. I'll get a few of them, hopefully. Found myself in uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama. And this was a period of time when the Army was going through one of their social experiments, and they had decided they were going to emphasize the, the role of the equality of women in the United States Army. So on Friday, I'm singing Jody calls about the relative temperature of certain pieces of the Eskimo anatomy. And then on Monday, we had to knock that stuff off. And I didn't think a thing about it at the time. But as I was putting this together, I thought about, my God, what it would have been like to be a young female soldier at that time and have to sing those songs loud or be accused of not having esprit de corps. And I can't say that's exactly a proud moment in my life when I started thinking about that stuff. Now, that wasn't the only diversity issues that were going on. I made a lot of friends um, when I was in the Army. I, I made good friends with an African-American private named Appleton from North Carolina, uh, a couple gangbangers from New York that had to either go to the Army or go to jail. I uh, made a friend, well, sort of made a friend. I had a fist fight in the first week with a gentleman from Arkansas, but we ended up being real good friends after that. And then we even had an immigrant named Gaspar, who was Romanian, who used to sit way too close to me when I was in my underwear polishing boots. <laughs> we all became good friends. We all had a good time. There was one guy, though. He's the saddest guy I think I ever met. His name is Bob, a fellow from Appalachia. He came from a town that was smaller than our platoon. I could barely understand him. Spoke English, but his accent was so thick, it was so hard. And this guy just had a hard time. Life was tough for him. His filters were different than the rest of us. He could never seem to quite get it. And he was always getting in trouble. I remember we had an exercise, live, live machine gun exercise, where we had to low crawl under the wire. We got bayonets fixed on our 16s, dragging them. And we had to go up the hill, sharp shale. It hurt. It hurt bad. Um, and I got lucky. I only had to do it twice. I don't know how many times Bob had to do it. Because every time he'd get to the top, that drill sergeant sent him back down. I remember the last time he made it to the top, drill sergeant told him to go back down again. And he snapped, and he went at that drill sergeant with his bayonet. Okay. Now, there ain't nothing right that Bob did that day. That's undisciplined. That's wrong. He lost it. Um, but his trial wasn't that hill. His trial started the first day of basic training. And it started because he was different. Now, when we start thinking about differences, a lot of times we think about this as a social phenomenon. And we're coming from a scientific background of social psychology and identity theory and all those things. Um, we'll get into a bit of that. But I'm going to try to take you in a little di different direction in the beginning. My name is Rich Griffith. I'm from right down the road here at Florida Tech. I'm only about 20 minutes away. And it is awesome to be back at Diomi. My institution's had a long, long relationship with Diomi. I've had an honor to come up here many, many times. A uh, good deal of my students, you probably met. They're, they're around here. I'm working really hard. Um, and I've had the privilege to be able to lead the Institute for Cross-Cultural Management for some years now. And we do a lot of work in this particular area, particularly in the in area of international diversity. I, I might not go down that road very much today. But um, I am going to start to get into a few things that I hope will be of interest to you. Um, I'm going to touch base a little bit on the notion of exclusion and uh, explain a little bit about why that's the norm. Inclusion is not the norm when we are working with people that are different than us. Uh, just make a quil real quick distinction between diversity management and inclusion. You guys are the pros. You know that stuff. So we'll, we'll blow through that real quick. Uh, my job here today is to talk a little bit about some best practices and implementation. How do we take this theoretical stuff and make it concrete? So that's, that's what I'm really going to try to do. And then talk about a use case of an organization that is doing outstanding work in this area. You probably know them, Sodexo. They probably bring in food to your, your dining hall uh, over here. And they bring food to every dining hall in the world. And then um, tell you a little bit about our experience down at, at FIT in terms of, of inclusion. So as I said before, when you start thinking about uh, this notion of, of differences, we often come at it from a social background. We tend to think about it as something that we learned as children. Our, our parents teach us. 
Uh, you know, we, never, we didn't know anybody was different until someone taught us that. Uh, our parents often teach us, our, our family teaches us, our community teaches us. If we're lucky, our parents also teach us that it's all right to be different. And you might meet someone different, that's okay. Um, some folks may not get that lesson, but there's more to it. It's deeper than just this social phenomenon or social psychology phenomenon. There's a deep biological basis to the notion of inclusion. We are social creatures, and that goes all the way down through the animal kingdom. All animals want to be included. Uh, you know, all, all, all of these creatures, the highest, particularly the higher creatures, want to be part of something, feel connected. If they're the same as their community members, if they're different, that's a different story. When you take a look at you know, basic primates, let's just talk about our chimpanzee friends that are out there. They have social awareness. They have self-awareness. They have theory of mind, just like we do. They also have in-group and out-group biases. They have culture. They have behaviors that they engage in that are not genetic, that differ by the locations in, in which they're in. So when they come from the same group, of course, they want to have inclusion. Of course, they want to be part of the family. But every now and then, those two cultures meet. What happens when all of a sudden we see the primates that are coming together that aren't the same? Exact same thing that happens when, a lot of times when humans get together and they're not the same and there's limited resources. You see conflict, you see war. So even at the very basic level, when we start thinking about exclusion, it's not something that's necessarily taught to us. We're hardwired to think different is dangerous. It's an evolutionary basis that has kept us safe back in the day when that made sense. But it doesn't make sense anymore. So we gotta fight our programming to be able to work through some of these things. That's what I'm gonna talk about today. We have to have an effortful uh, program to be able to make sure that we're including people because the default is exclusion. And that's just a biological fact. So if we're not gonna fight that hardware, we're in a lot of trouble. So I had a good friend of mine, her name's Darby Proctor. She's a, she is a primatologist and I said, what, tell me a little bit about the primates that are good at crossing these borders. Someone's got to be better than another, right? Because they, they get together, they breed. She said, oh, yeah, that's easy. They're female. I said, oh, well, tell me why. She said, well, the females have social skills. I said, well, that's interesting. That tells me something. Uh, that rings true. And uh, she, so she said, so they have to leave their family, and they have to join another tribe. So they've got to learn how to cross that border. They get empathy. They have to pick up social skills. So they actually ferry the new people into the tribe. I said, so that's actually a skill-based thing. Yeah, 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 and they actually have to go through a bit of danger to do that. They have to go out of their way. I said, oh, that, that sounds pretty much like what we got to do. We're going to have to go out on a limb. We're going to have to learn some new skills. We're going to have to put some effort in to being able to make sure that people that are different than us get included in our tribe. So you all know the deal between you know, diversity management and, and inclusion. I just want to make sure I make the quick distinction uh, so that I don't mess up with the language here. When, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about diversity, it often falls down to the sort of demographic differences. You may be a little bit older than me. You might come from a different place. We might look a little bit different. Those are your surface differences. But the idea is that because of these surface differences, we have differences in a, our life experiences, and that changes the lens with which we view the world, and we make sense of the world. And in a perfect world, when you put all these people together, and we can work through some of this stuff, we have more alternatives, which means we solve problems better. And we come up with better solutions. And at the end of the day, we're better able to accomplish our mission. And to be able to do that, we want to manage diversity. And that's simply just bringing people into the organization using the systems that we have. Now, I'm an IO psychologist, so in most corporations, we're thinking about how to get the right people in and recruit them and train them up um, and, and get them into groups so they can work together. So that's all that is. That's, that's the easy part of the system. Now, what, you know, in terms of diversity, we often think about the surface level stuff, and, and we can see it. So we might have gender, we might have race, but there's lots of different things that affect the way we think. You know, you come from one side of the track, so you come from the other. That's a different lens. You know, I, I work in an engineering school. Boy, you want to talk about differences in perspective. I got to talk to engineers. There's a reason why they're engineers. Okay? They don't like people. They don't understand people. They want to go build a robot girlfriend. So now we got to we got to work through that to have a conversation. So that's where I've been living for, for 20 years. So there's lots of differences that we can have. So don't, we don't want to just narrow it down to these differences that, are, are, that we can see. 
particularly because your brain has no idea what those differences are. Your brain has no idea what culture is. That's not real. We made that up so that we can understand differences in behavior when people come from different places. It's just a label. What your brain knows is two things, same and different. It's a biological fact. When we go to process information, that's the distinction that we're making. So let me tell you really quickly how that distinction works. When we meet someone within the first uh, 250 milliseconds, we determine whether they're human or not. We say, hmm, person or shovel? 250 milliseconds. In the next 250 milliseconds, we make the determination, are they same as me or are they different? So now we're up to half a second. If they're, if they're the same, we go through deep processing. If we determine that they're different, we process the information about that person in a different place in our brain. It's more shallow, it leads to stereotypes. And in the next less than half of a second, we have our first affective reaction to them. We, we, at an unconscious level, we decide whether we like them or not. In sort of the caveman way of, oh, good, bad. In less than a second, we've made a, dis a determination about whether we like a person. And then that dictates how we interact with them and what we think about them. And we don't even know we did that. It's completely automatic. So when we meet someone who's different, <coughs> We're already going, we've got to fight uphill, man. The cards are stacked against us uh, in terms of inclusion. This is something I always tell executives when I work with them. I think people feel guilty about having implicit bias. They often come to me and they're like, you know, I, I don't know, I didn't, my parents are good people. Um, and you know, I tell them, listen, man, everybody has it. It's the way you were built. The brain was built to categorize things. It's really good at categorizing things. It does it with people, too. Even if you're in that group, we know that we've got implicit bias, so that's not your fault. Now, if you embrace those biases, that's prejudice. We've got another conversation we've got to have about that. Um, but you know, implicit bias is, just comes with the hardware. What we've got to do is work with the software so that we can help people out and kind of reshuffle that deck so that it's going to work out better for our, our mission and better for all the people that we're trying to serve. So when we start thinking about diversity, I think that's been the goal. We want to have diversity, right? We want to get people in the organization that are different than us. Okay, well, that's a good first step. And if we don't do that, then nothing else happens. So we've got to have a little bit of diversity. But if you just bring someone into the organization and you don't take the next step of managing some of those cognitive errors that are going on in the attitudes, you make things worse. You can make people miserable. They're going to go through a life of exclusion. Okay? You know, when I think about this, I just think about uh, a fella who, you know, I see these fellas, they're sort of uh, TV mechanics, and they go out to Sears, and they buy the best toolbox in the world, man. You go into the garage, you're like, nice. This is a nice setup in here. What are you working on? You got a hot rod? You got a bike? What do you mean? Well, you got to be building something, man. This, this place is really decked out. No, man, I got an awesome set of tools. You're like, oh, you're one of those, huh? Okay. Well, that's what the diversity management is. You're, you got all the tools in the shop. You brought everybody in. Everybody's different, right? But you're not maximizing the power of that. Right? You're leaving that toolbox closed. We'd be able to do a lot of really good things if we took the next step. And, and to do that, what we've got to be able to do is start thinking about those, those inclusion practices uh, and make sure that they're not conceptual, they're not theoretical, that we make them real. Because if we don't, we make, we're, going to make, we're going to cause damage. We're going to damage units. We're going to damage individuals. Yeah, you folks have probably heard this term before. It's all in the, in the team literature, this notion of fault lines. So when we bring people in and we can find commonalities and we can emphasize those commonalities and we have a, we have a consistent goal and we give people the tools to, to move towards that goal and we give them voice to be able to try to achieve that goal, well then, good things happen. When we don't, what happens? Those cracks in the ground start. And somebody ends up on one side of the crack and somebody ends up on the other. And inevitably, the goodies are on one side of that crack. And that means people are going to be excluded. That may be from the organizational goodies they want, you know, stable life and a promotion. That might be from just having their voice heard or they have got good ideas that they can't share. How's that going to make you feel? It's not going to be good. So morale's going to decrease. You're going to have more conflict. So it's nothing but a problem if we don't manage diversity from from the get-go and start really thinking about inclusion. So conceptually, what are we talking about? Well, we want to make sure that people have the information that they need. 
to be able to make decisions and influence decisions, the resources that they need to be part of the clan. Not just be in the work groups, be allowed to be fully engaged in the work group. My dad thinks I'm crazy. He worked at General Motors 32 years. He, was a, he um, drove a forklift, so he was hourly. And I remember when I was a kid, I, I, I guess, I don't know, I'm, my, some of my, my friend's dads were white collar. So I'm like, hey dad, don't you want to be foreman? Don't you want to do something like that? He's like, well, you're crazy. You know, I work, I get done with work. We can go fishing, we can go play ball. What are you talking about? You know, why would I want to do that? I wish I'd have listened to him some days. I'd be surfing right now. You know, this notion of engagement is funny. Engagement is the idea that you will give more than 100% of yourself to your organization. And I find myself doing that quite often. I, I love my work. I, I like what I do. Um, but that's the whole idea. I'm, I'm allowed to do that. No one stops me. I get mad when my boss won't let me work harder, when they won't let us succeed more. It makes me frustrated. I couldn't imagine my boss wouldn't even let me play the game. How awful would that be? So not only do you get to be engaged in it, you're heard. You got ideas. They're able to go up the ladder. You can influence the direction of the organization. That's a true definition of inclusion. I, I think the idea then is that all of that comes together and then everybody thinks that's cool, that it's a good thing, and that we benefit from that, and we all feel good about that. So uh, there's no judgment that's going on. We're generally accepting of differences. You know, they're going to be confusing. You're going to run into troubles every now and then. But you're one of the clan. And that, that, to me, that's as simple as it is uh, when it comes to inclusion. But that's, you know, that's an easy definition. Everybody, everybody has a definition. How do we get there? How do we, what, what kind of best practices do we need? So to start with, yeah, we need diversity management. Okay? We know we, we, that's sort of been pushed to the side. Hey, hey, that's old school, right? Well, man, if everybody in the room is the same, then it's pretty tough to have inclusion. Okay? It's, it's, you know, the, the, the point is moot. So you do need to have these practices. At that point, where do you start? You start at the top. You get your leaders to understand, you know, not that it's a good thing to have, and it's not a nice to have. And we don't do it because, um, you know, we're bleeding hearts or, you know, the, there's a moral in it somewhere. The idea is you do it because it makes your organization more effective, and the data supports that time and time again. You know, the business case for inclusion has long been set. It's expensive. You know, it takes a little while to get there. It takes a little bit of effort to get there, but you got to get your leaders to buy into that. And the people that have influence in the organization, your key stakeholders, are going to do that. I think you got to develop leaders that are authentic. A right? different style of leadership. It's not your tried and true MBA leadership that a lot of us were, you know, that we modeled after. What's an authentic leader? Someone's got a little self-awareness. Hopefully a lot of self-awareness if it all goes well. They can take perspective. They can think about what it might be like to step in someone else's shoes Don't, and not lose themselves. You get some folks that go native. Uh, You've know, you got to be able to be in both pair of shoes. Got to stand in your leader's shoes and also stand in your, in your follower's shoes. Be able to communicate um, in a genuine fashion with people. And you've got to be able to listen. To me, that's the key to authentic leadership. And listen from a, you know, a couple different sources. When individuals come to you, you've got to have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. When people feel safer in a group, and they want the group to represent their ideas, you've got to be able to listen to that group. You're going to have to be able to listen to the environment, to be able to hear what's going on outside your organization or outside of your particular sphere, uh, sphere of, of influence. And then I think what you've got to be able to do is build a pipeline of those leaders because it's going, we're going to need a lot of them. That's one of the major problems that's facing us today. We have a lack of leaders. In general, we have a lack of leaders. Just, just from an economic perspective, we should be doing a lot better than we are in the, in the global economy. A lot of folks said, oh, no, we had that big crisis that happened, and, you know, that slowed things down, and we're moving along. We'd be moving quicker. If you take a look at the data, why has that happened? Because we don't have enough leaders to drive global initiatives. Why is that? Because we don't have enough leaders that can deal with people that are different. That's not a skill set that we develop in individuals. That's not a skill set that's valued enough yet. It's, that's going to change. So we've got to build a pipeline where we are building these authentic leaders that understand the power of inclusion and that model that behavior and champion that behavior. And once we start doing that, we got a chance. So we start at the top. Those are the kind of things we can do with these leadership development programs. Now, what are some things that we could do that are other best practices? Well, you got to make sure everybody can get to the information. Okay? Now, I understand the notion of security and all those things. Not everybody gets to see everything. You got to make sure people are vetted in terms of, of information. But if there's no security concerns, then everybody should be able to look at everything. 
is because that's where good ideas come, is where we take divergent pieces of data and put them together. You take an analysis that isn't supposed to fit this piece of data, and all of a sudden you go, my, my, what is the answer to this little puzzle that we have? And people who have different perspectives will pick up tools in different ways and do that. You've got to give them access to do that. Job security is a little interesting thing in the military. It's, it's a little different. You've got to at least have psychological security. You've got to be able to feel safe in your environment, that you can make a mistake, and it's not going to be the end of your career, that you can say something that's unpopular in the moment because you know it's right, and that's not going to be the end of your career. So we have to put that explicitly in policies. We have to make it so that people see that they, they are safe. And then we have to make sure that we follow those policies, uh, not just the letter of the law, the spirit of the law in terms of how they are, they are enacted. One thing I always thought the military did really good was, was um, I did feel like I was on the same team. I got a kick out of that when all of a sudden, no, no, everybody, everybody here is green. Like, That's cool. I feel pretty green today. And at some level, I remember it was funny. I couldn't tell anybody apart because everybody had a shaved head. Everybody was in uniform, and it took me a while. I figured out I could start to walk, figure out who they were by how they walked, you know, their nonverbals. And I thought, geez, I really, we are really the same. We are a unit. So I thought the Army does that really, really well. What they might not do well is encourage open dialogue. And I hear a lot of yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, when maybe the answer is, well, maybe, ma'am. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a longer discussion, ma'am. Uh, so that might be something that is going to challenge the culture of the military. And, you know, there's times, that there's not, there's times where that's not right. We've got to move. We've got to be decisive. I understand that. There's times where there might be some wiggle room in that. And then at the end of the day, I think one of the things that we do is we make sure the organization is singularly focused on what matters to us. And we talk about that. Maybe it's performance. Maybe it's other things. I'll talk a little bit about what we do at Florida Tech. That's something I am very proud about with our, our, our group of individuals. I think we are focused, and we're on the same page in that regard. So those are some tangible things that you can do. This afternoon, I'm going to work with you folks to take that down to the concrete level. I'm going to say, that's nice. That's a nice concept that you like. What are you going to do about that? What behaviors will you change? What policies will you change? What procedures will you change? And I'm going to challenge you to get concrete with that. We're going to try to make sure that when you go home, we're going to do something about these things that you learned here, these, these wonderful experts. So. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about a, a use case of an organization uh, that is doing this awesome. You want to you uh, get some good resources, you want to learn about a company that has great inclusion practices, uh, Sodexo is the company that you want to look at. How many people know the company Sodexo or have worked with Sodexo? Okay, a few. It's a French company, but they are all over the world. Like I said, I, I guarantee someone from Sodexo is on this post somewhere. I mean, they're almost insidious. If they, if they started figuring out how to put stuff in our food with mind control, we'd be done. We'd be done. They, uh, they got access to every burger in the, in the world. Now, um, when you get this slide, um, you can go to this. You, these slides are going to be avail available to you electronically. When you get these, you can click on Sodexo, and it's going to take you to um, some handouts uh, that you can get that will have all this stuff in much deeper, in deeper detail. And then... Man, I cannot encourage you enough to really go through their website and look at their area of inclusion because they've got all kinds of resources there. So when you're thinking about putting a plan into action, you know, no, no need to recreate the wheel. You can take a look at what people are doing and then see if you can modify it to your context. So, and I am not paid by Sodexo. I'm not, you know, I'm not sponsored by Sodexo in any way. I've just worked with them, and they're, they're serious about this. They're real. You know how you can tell, like, you're working with someone, and they're giving you lip service about something? It's not what they're doing. This is a passion for these folks. So I'm, I enjoy working with them very much. So when we start thinking about uh, the company, why are they doing this? Well, because they have to. I mean, they're a huge global company. So they're all over the world. They've got about a half a million employees. You know, more than 130 countries are represented in the organization. They're just about everywhere you can be. Um, and they do good at it. They're making a lot of money, $24 billion in revenue. Our good colleague, Richard Hope, would, would, if he were here saying that, he would say, that's billion with a B. So that's big money. It's not a million, billion, big, big money that they're, that they're making. So they're not doing this out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing this because it makes them more money. It makes them much more effective at the end of the day. So once again, you know, their, their rationale is not because it's the right thing to do per se. I'd like to think that some of those folks are, are, are driven by that, but it's the business case. 
that's driving a lot of their inclusion practices. They are by far and away the most recognized organization in this area. So, you know, Diversity Inc. had them at number one many, many times. You look at the last 10 years, they're always in the top five. They're doing really, really good. Um, I could run down the list uh, of organizations. I got them in my notes here, but I don't think those details are all important. Trust me on this. They're widely recognized as the thought leader um, in the area of, of inclusion. So I think they are kind of tip of the spear in, in these types of practices. So what are they doing that, that kind of puts them in that spot? You know, and, and their mission's different, so it may, it may not fit out all the stuff that you're doing, but some of it might. So, uh, you know, the notion of, of inclusion is part of their strategic plan. It's, it's part of their vision for the organization. It's not something that they say, okay, here's where we're going to go, and oh, by the way, if we do this thing, then we'll be better at it. No, it's a core value uh, of their overall organization. So when you take a look at their growth strategies, it's built in. So for instance, by 2022, I want to say, uh, they want to make sure that 100% of the units in their organization have implemented the program that they have in terms of age diversity. They want to make sure that people that are re-entering the workforce feel they have a place and that they can have the skills to contribute and the voice to bring their wisdom to the table. That's built right into their strategic plan and it has metrics to see if they're meeting those metrics. And some of those metrics are yes, no, check the box, to see is that plan in place, and then they're, they're gonna evaluate that plan to see how well that it's working. So built right into their particular strategy. I, I picked up on this quote, I really like this. That's one, one of the reasons I wanna toss it in there. So what is one of the things Sodexo tries to do? Strive to create a safe environment in which all employees can bring their whole self to work. That's cool. You know, I, I can't imagine, I don't have to hide too much. I guess I, I probably have a few quirks. I like to walk around the house with no shirt on. I can't do that at work very often anyway. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I can do whatever I want at work. I don't feel like I'm constrained at work. I couldn't imagine what that would be like to have to sort of be wearing a mask, uh, to not be able to truly express yourself and your thoughts in the workplace. How, how heavy that would be on your heart. To, to not be able to, to let it all hang out um, with the people that, that say they want you to be part of the gang. So I, I think that's a pretty cool part of their mission. A great resource for you are their um, blogs and their newsletters. Really detailed, great implementation stuff that you'll find in there. So these aren't soft fluff pieces that they have. So if you're looking for resources, that's a great place to, to be able to go. They are representing uh, these ideas of inclusion and driving these from the very top. So they got a chief diversity officer. I think everybody got one of those now. It's not as big a deal, but it, she's powerful in the organization. She reports uh, right to the CEO, Ro uh, Rohini Anand uh, is her name. She's awesome. We had a chance to work with her um, when she was down here at the summit a few years ago. Uh, incredible executive presence and oh, just a really great vision. And her people love her. They love her. So you can just tell that they're really dedicated to, to the overall mission. And then they get everybody included with these task forces that they have. So from the, you know, the lowest person that's scooping uh, mac and cheese onto a plate, uh, to the HR community, to their operational leaders, they, they pick 15 of these people all across the world and they bring them together to start to, to put plans together and then implement uh, those plans. So they're, they're committing resources to this. This isn't something that is just an idea that turns into, you know, a piece on a, on a blog or on a website. They're, they're really pushing towards this. You know, you know when you can tell a company that's serious about this? You look at their board. So tell me about their, their executive board. Tell me who's on that board and I'll tell you who's serious about inclusion right away because a lot of that's lip service if you take a look. A lot of those board members look a lot like me except they're ha more handsome they got hair. Uh, probably wear ties and stuff. But their board is 50% uh, women on that board. Right? And they uh, have taken a look at that data. What you see is that in their units, when they reach that level, when they have 50% representation with women, those units do better financially. And so there's, there's again, the business case uh, for inclusion that they have. So they are, they're walking the, they're walking the talk. They're not necessarily just kind of throwing it out there. So um, some other things they do, mentorship programs, not your traditional ones. I think that's cool. They have a really, very, really nice cross-cultural mentoring program. So, you know, you got uh, people that go overseas and they're expats 
expats often come home and they really don't like home anymore. You know how it is, you can never go home? After you've been abroad, you kind of get the bug. You, you like, you like the, being out there in, in the world. Um, so they do those where the expats come back and they'll mentor people and help them as they're going overseas. They mentor other companies. Well, think about that. They're trying to make other companies better. That doesn't happen. People try to keep their secrets because it's a competitive advantage. They want to give it away. So they're helping companies improve their, their inclusion practices. So I mean, if, you're, if you are in private industry and you want to connect with those folks, let me know because it's quite shocking. They'll just say, yeah, here's all these resources. You know, it's pretty cool to see people uh, do that for a change instead of kind of scurry them away a little bit. Of course, they got training. Man, they got all kind of training, tons of it, um, it can, you know, across a variety of different contexts. I've saw quite a bit. Um, they have a cool one. It's called Disability. Ability is capitalized. And it's really about bringing people in that um, have some physical challenges, make sure that they are uh, in, you know, included in the workforce. Um, underrepresented youth. I saw some interesting training in that particular area. Literally, you pick an area, and they've got training programs for it. So that, and training is the most expensive thing you could do in an organization. Once again, they are investing in that. Employee network groups. I think this is a really cool idea. I've seen this implemented here a lot. I was doing some work over at Harris Corporation yesterday. I have to apologize. I wasn't able to be here. Uh, and I, was, I was explaining uh, just a minute ago that uh, Harris donates a lot of money to my university. So if I didn't head over there, I might, I might be looking for a job up here today. So I could have been in trouble. So um, they do these employee resource groups. So OK, we're going to have inclusion, right? That means we're all going to come together. Now we're all giving up our identities. We're all going to be Sodexo, or we're all going to be Diomi, or we're all going to be Harris. Well, man, you can hang on to your identity a little bit. You know, it's OK to do that. It's nice to be able to sit down with someone who's had your context and be able to tell stories. I've got a contract now up at Fort Bragg. I've been having the time of my life um, being out at night under the stars, seeing the red light, and just feeling it and hearing, hearing Army language again. It feels good. It feels good. You should be able to do that. You know? So if you're Puerto Rican, you can sit down with some folks from the island talk about your childhood. You know, if, you, if you're a veteran, it's good to be able to have those kind of conversations. Nothing wrong with that. That's not walling off anybody. Anybody can go to these groups. If I want to go to the Puerto Rican group, I can do that if I want to be able to do that. And I see a lot of that. I see a lot of that going on out here. So they do quite a bit of that stuff. The big one is voice. I mean, you got to make sure that people feel they can be heard. And that's both in an informal sense and a formal sense. So a lot of times we think about grievance processes and those sorts of things. I'll get to that. You, do, you need those. You've got to have those kind of things in, in place. Uh, but we have to have other channels where people can be heard. Um, and you know, that may be through conversation. That may be through being able to broadcast it more widely through the, through the organization. So there's some other things I mentioned um, in terms of them connecting with people in the community that I think they also do a real good job of um, in terms of reaching out with community partnerships so they will Okay, they'll partner with other organizations that have similar missions. Uh, a lot of times not, not for profits uh, that are working in this area of, of inclusion or working to make the lives better for people that have been homeless and are trying to re-enter the workforce or you know, people that are coming from any particular background. They throw some really nice shindigs um, when it comes to learning events. So when you talk about a company that's got $24 billion, well, they could throw a conference. Um, and they're, they're really good. I got a chance to keynote at a conference some, some time ago and was really blown away at the expertise in the room. Really smart, smart people uh, that are there. And, and they didn't come there to talk. They came there to learn. So the environment is a real good environment in terms of picking up some of these, these particular skills. They're driving policy. So they work with local governments to be able to enact policy changes uh, that are going to better benefit people or, or help people you know, work their way into the Sodexo world or other, other worlds, and lots of other public outreach through some of the, the methods that I had talked about before in terms of, you know, the kinds of uh, communication channels that you might see that would normally reach the, these other communities. So that's Sodexo, and, and as you can tell, I'm a fan. I really like the work that they're doing, and, and I try to learn from them as much as I can. So um, when the dean was kind enough to ask me to, to come up to speak, um, he had mentioned, uh, you know, well, I'd like to hear a little bit about what you're doing at Florida Tech and, and some of the things there, because that's kind of international down there, right? I said, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm a little uncomfortable. I, 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 so I try to, to backload this one a little bit. Uh, 
Oh, I don't necessarily want to beat our chest, but I think we're doing some things down there that are um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, Florida Tech is highly international, so more than 120 countries uh, are represented. We're about 30 percent. Um, international, so you got a lot of international diversity, but you got a lot of diversity across the board. Uh, these are just three of my students that were uh, at an event. I was going through pictures last night. It was kind of fun. I had a whole bunch of them. Um, but that's Dr. Leah Wolfeld and Dr. Charlie Scott and Ambar Rodriguez. Uh, Leah, uh, she's a hippie. She's a hippie that sort of traveled around the world um, and just kind of got, got the culture bug and came and got her PhD. Charlie's an openly gay man, met him in uh, Orlando, and he is a serious scientist, man. This kid is smart, smart kid. Uh, Ambar's from Panama. Um, so if you were to go walk through the halls in our program, that's just the beginning. That's just what it's like. Just people coming from all over the place. I'm the minority. I, you know, in, in, in my field, in IO psychology, it's 70% women. So I, I have to admit, sometimes it slips my mind when I hear someone talking about women's issues um, in the workplace and leadership and, and really kind of getting through the ceiling, I forget because I constantly work with really smart women all the time. They're so much smarter and better than I am. And they're flying through the organization, moving all the way, you know, moving through the organization that I forget it's not like that everywhere. And then not all professions are like that until I look across the field at the engineers where they only have three full professors, you know, in a, in a faculty of a couple hundred. So while I'm proud at some areas of FIT and other areas, we've got some work to do. We've got some work to do. Um, so what are some things that we do in, in our program? I'll just share uh, more, more storytelling, I guess. So I mentioned before that we try to make our values really clear. Um, I remember I had a really cool opportunity. So I was in grad school, and I was just getting ready to graduate with my PhD. Florida Tech got a hold of me, called me down for an interview, and they said, hey, would you want to come down here and start a PhD program? And I thought, oh, you're kidding me. I'm a student. You know, like tomorrow I'm going to come down here and be a professor, and you're going to let me start a PhD program? And I thought about it a little bit. You know how sometimes you're just too dumb to know that you can't do it? You know, one of those things. And uh, so I took the gig. And we didn't have a great environment in my grad program. It was highly politicized. Uh, they used students against each other. Some of those folks just weren't the nicest people in the world, you know. It's from Akron, Ohio. I get how you get mean in Akron, Ohio. I live in Youngstown, so I, I get that. It's gray and nasty, uh, but that's no excuse. So I had a 14-hour drive to get down here, and in that 14 hours, I was talking with Lisa. She's now the, the going to, fingers crossed, she got a good shot at being dean. She's an outstanding faculty member. I'm talking to Lisa, and I said, okay, there's some really awesome stuff that uh, we learned at, at Akron, and I'm proud of those things. There's some stuff I'm not so proud of. Let's get a list of the things we're gonna take with us, and let's get a list of the things that we're gonna cut loose, and we're gonna leave behind, and we're never gonna do that. We're gonna commit to not doing that in this car ride. We're gonna start a program with a culture that is gonna um, be a different culture. And we had all this big, long list. And I remember the first time I'm giving a presentation to my new students when I told them we're going to build the number one program in the world. I got this long list, and they can't remember that stuff. They got all this paperwork. So the next year came around, I said, I got to simplify this. And I looked at the list, and I said, you know, pretty much I see two things coming out of this. So when I went to the presentation, I said, there's two things you got to do around here to get things right. You got to work hard. You got to be cool. You do those two things, good things are going to happen to you. You can't do those two things, you might want to look for another program. And if you're going to prioritize those two things, you be cool. We'll get back to the work. And now, work hard translates all around the world. That's pretty much the same anywhere you go. Be cool is different. Lots of variations of what be cool is. So I have to communicate what that is to people. And I'll tell them, listen, you need to be quick to forgive. People are going to make mistakes. Your way is not the only way. There are many paths to success. So we have to be open to these different ideas, and we want to test these different ideas. We have to be respectful of the way people live, even if it's not the way we believe that we should live. It might not hurt to ask some questions about that, because you might change your mind about living that way. And, and we kind of make it clear. Um, and you know, we tell people, hey, listen, the human, human matters more to me than the task at the end of the day. I've had many times where we're in the middle of a project, someone comes to me, comes to me and says, hey, my brother's got cancer. Get out of here, man. Go take care of life. We'll come back. The work will be here when you get back. We'll get to that later. And we're going to take care of people because at the end of the day, then, my people will take care of me. 
and work gets done. So that's how we live. Those are our values. We talk about them all the time. My, my students are running around here somewhere. You know, catch one of them, ask them, how, how do you guys roll down at Florida Tech? I'll bet you money they'll tell you that because we hammer it. It's, it's something we, we really believe in. So make your values clear. You know, have core values. I think that's key. If you're a leader, you've got to make sure you've got a moral center, you know, an ethical center. Voice, I think, is really critical. One of the things that I've tried to do, and this is with my faculty and my students, is, um, you know, I have goals. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of competitive. They've changed over time. When I did get down there, I said, we're going to be the number one I.O. program in the world. And I remember, I was the only faculty member. And I remember my dean saying, what are you doing? Because I think I was still coming out of the military. I was being a total hard ass. And I'm oh, 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 and really driving them. And um, over time, I thought, you know what? Being number one, that was a cool goal. But man, that hill is big. Let's bring people up on the hill. And we wanted to start sharing our ideas and helping other programs grow. So my, my goals are a little bit bigger now. But when I bring people in, whether it be faculty or students, I tell them right off the bat, um, we got big goals around here. And guess what? You can be part of that. You know, you're never going to get a chance as a student to build a program. But I have students that are completely operating independently from me. I sent one of my students to Spain to negotiate a contract with the five oldest universities in Europe because I couldn't go. I had some stuff I had to do, so I sent her. Julie, she's a rock star and fantastic. Put her in a situation where she didn't know the language and said, figure it out. And she came back and briefed me, and she did a fantastic job. When I, I just was over there visiting those folks just uh, a month ago, and they said, well, where's Julie? And I was like, oh, OK, oh, I guess it's just me. Uh, they love her. They love her. I got students that are you know, out talking to the CEO of the Orlando airport on a project that we're working on. So they, they're part of the team. And now you don't get there on day one. Of course not. We gotta, you know, we're going to have to groom you and build you up. So all of those senior students are teaching those junior students because at the end of the day, you want someone good to take your job. You don't want them to ruin everything you built. So everybody's trying to pull the rope in the same direction. We've got different ideas about how to do that. And they feel safe talking about those ideas. One of the things we did explicitly on day one is say, your funding is not tied to a particular professor. That's the thing I hated when I was at Akron. My funding was tied to a professor. If I didn't do what he liked, well, my, my, I don't get no more mac and cheese. I get kicked out of school. And guess what? If he didn't like another professor, well, then they started playing chess with the students. And what we tell the students is, hey, you can work with anybody you want here. You know, you come in, you're my student, and, and I'm just trying to help you get started. But you might not like my research, you might not like my philosophy, that's cool. You want to go work with Pat? You want to go work with Lisa? You want to work with Albert? Just let me know and then go tell them and we can make that all work. And then they can move around and it allows them to work with different people with different ideas. They can then uh, take different perspectives and they put those together. And when they walk out of the program, they're better than any of us individually because they've had a chance to kind of to have those experiences. That's something I'm really, really proud of. They have access to all the information that they can that is not protected by the law. So my finances at ICCM are absolutely open. My student Vivian handles my budget. So guess what? I gotta, I gotta play right because it's open. Anybody can walk in there. It's sitting right on a Google Drive. You wanna see my budget? I don't care, I'll send it to you. You can see how much money we don't have. That's no problem. Um, and, I, and, I, and that way they kind of see, hey, this is how you build an organization. And when they walk out, I mean, my executive team is all PhD students. And, you know, they're, they're handling all the functions uh, of the organization. They're doing a great job. I wish I could hire them all permanently, man. I'm, I'm going to be sad when this team goes. They're the best team I've ever had. I'm really proud to say I say that every year. They just keep getting better and better. It's not hard to recruit to get them to come to ICCM because they have voice. So when they get to make a choice to, hey, do you want to go to Akron or do you want to come to Florida Tech? Well, guess where they come? They come to Florida Tech because we want to help those folks. What we really try to do at the end of the day is we live what we say. I know that's hard, and, then, and, that, and that's, that's why you guys are making the big bucks, and that's why you're in leadership positions, because it's not all talk. You've got to do the hard things, and you've got to take the heat for people that not, may not believe the same things that you believe in. Um, so, you know, hats off to you. I, I have some understanding of some of the roles that you're you're in, you're all special folks. Very much appreciated. You're gonna make our service much better, make, make our world much better in the, in the long run because you are living your values at the end of the day. So at Florida Tech, man, we're done with this apples oranges thing and I'm into some sagria. Throw it all in a bucket and you know, it all works better. 
uh, when we're together. I've learned, I've learned an awful lot about the world and never had to leave the sleepy little beach town of Melbourne Beach. I've been out and about since, uh, but, but I've had a lot of students come from the world and teach me their culture and teach me their viewpoints and then sometimes teach me just how crazy Americans really are. It's funny when you leave and then come back and you can see American culture, you're like, wow, we are mentally ill. We work really, really hard. We should take vacations every now and then. Be much better. Put the email away when we're, when we're on vacation. So when we're all working together, when we do try to take those barriers down, and we don't even think about barriers until we sort of bounce into a difference, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. You're not from here. I forgot about that. Um, then, then I know that we're happier uh, at the end of the day, and I know that that's a goal uh, for your organization, not just happy, but being more effective uh, at, the, at the end of the day. So um, in summary... We've got, to, we've got to fight uphill. We've got to swim upstream because our biology doesn't want us to play with people that are different than us. Different is dangerous, is the way that your brain has worked. And that's a hardware problem. Luckily, we can rewrite the software. The software we want is different is dynamic. It's going to make you more agile. And it's going to make you better at what you do. But you've got to fight that biology because that's, that's the way you were born. You can't change that. Okay? So we know the difference between just counting beans and, and, and counting on people in, in when we bring them into the organization. Um, and hopefully I was able to show you just a couple things Sodexo's doing. Frankly, I went through that at such a high level. It's tricky, but you can get the resources online. Again, we're going to talk this afternoon about how to do some implementation. Tell you just a little bit about what we're doing down the road at, at Florida Tech. So if all goes well, you might be able to take a couple of these things home. Um, and the next Bob, his, his hill might not be so bad. You know, he might get to do what he really wanted to do, which is serve his country, rather than getting kicked out of the Army for being different. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, um, again, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. So earlier you talked about, oh, Dr. Herbin, Department of the Army. Um, earlier you, you mentioned a term, um, and it sounded really simple, but it was very profound to me. You said that you all were focusing on age diversity. And so if you look at diversity and put the word in front of diversity versus after diversity, you're actually targeting what the um, disparate, you know, disparate thing is in your organization. So can you give me a, an example or go more into detail how you identify the specific type of diversity? Because I thought that was really profound. The, so the different types of diversity in general or um, around age? Now, I would say when we were, what I was referring to was primarily Sodexo. Okay. Now, I would say, in all likelihood, those probably start with Title VII issues okay. when we start to think about it. That, that's, that's in your face because we got compliance issues uh, that are starting to happen. That would be interesting. I could probably get you a specific answer from Rohini. If I had to think about it a bit, if you make channels where people feel they have voice, when they bump up against an exclusion barrier, that should start to work its way to someone who is collecting that data. Now, I don't know at the level it needs to accumulate before the alarm goes off. Because in an organization of a half million people, maybe one person who is 41 that didn't get promoted because someone who was 21 got promoted, or vice versa, for that matter, might not bubble to the top. But if, if you're starting to hear that ping too much, then that's a problem and you may need to put a program in place. So if I had to guess, I know they're a very data-driven organization. They've got to have some metrics in place and some reporting mechanisms that would collect the voice of the employee that likely would signal those things. That's, that's not data-driven, but I could get you an answer. I'd be happy to connect you with uh, Ms. Anand if you'd like. That must have been a terrible answer. He gave up the microphone like, nah, <laughs> this guy's full of it, man. This guy full of it. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, thank you for your service. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. The question that I have is that uh, you, you mentioned that you have a whole team of PhDs yeah. or PhD candidates. Um, we were talking yesterday about millennials, and it, it, the impression that I, I received, it seemed as if millennials just swooped down uh, from another planet they were into the workforce, and we just don't quite get them. Yeah. So given that you work with PhDs, then these, uh, we are also receiving many millennials coming in for 
uh, our EOAC programs and RCC programs, then how do we exactly get the best out of them? That's great. Thank that's, you. That's a, that's a really good question. So let me, let me qualify it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll at least tell you my experience. Um, so does the data show that millennials are different than other generations? No, it doesn't. Our experience says that they're different. Why? It's because we're in a different cohort. So usually what shows that the difference, it's where you are in, the, in your age range. So I remember when I was their age, I was a Gen Xer. So what's the problem? Uh, Y'all just want to listen to Nirvana and you're not working and you're just laying around drinking beer, which was mostly true at the time. Um, but that was just where I was in that time of life. You know, I'm 26, I didn't have anything. I had a, you know, a cart full of CDs that I could throw in the car and go. I had no responsibility. I had, uh, you know, I didn't have the depth to understand at that time that um, by not contributing that I was holding people back. Um, so when you start to look at where you're at, you'll see the behaviors of the cohorts are about the same. I remember one point in time, so I did a workshop on, on age diversity. And this was a group of uh, Gen Y folks, and they said, oh, man, these baby boomers, you know, they, they don't want to take any risks. They're living it safe. They're, you know, they got the easy life, blah, blah, blah. And this woman got up and said, how dare you say that? I protested the Vietnam War, I did acid, I was at Woodstock, I had a lot of risk in my life, little lady. Let me talk to you about what risk is. And it was, she was 19, in 60 whatever that was, I don't know. Uh, so that has something to do with it. Now, are, are there some real differences? Sure, because the context is different. Um, you know, in terms of how, how we communicate, boy, you see that right away. Uh, you know, people are going to want to text or IM each other a little bit more. Why? Because it's available. I probably would have done it when I was that age, too. I'm an introvert. I don't want to talk to people. If I can, if I could send an email or an IM, I might do that, too. So I would be not quick to necessarily put them in a bucket. Um, in terms of how to get the most out of them, what I found is those folks want to serve. They want to they wanna do something bigger than themselves. Give them big tasks. I've had a couple of them come to me and they say, Rich, is this all there is to grad school? First years, of course. I haven't got to them yet. Is this all there is to grad school? Because this doesn't seem all that tough. I'm, I'm kind of bored. Oh, really? You want something else to do? <laughs> come on into my office. I got some initiatives. Happy to hand you one. You run that. You, know, you, you build your team, you run that. You need some help getting that going, let me know. So I think give them, give them something meaningful. Give them meaningful work. Um, and, and, you know, then give them some room to make mistakes and then, you know, help, help learn from it. I don't know if that fits your experience or not, um, but, I, but it fits mine a bit. I'm not sure that the differences are as big as we think. I think there are some, but I think they're a little more surface differences than substantive differences. I think we've got time for one more. Awesome. Or do we? Are we calling? Are we pulling the plug? One more? We'll do one, one quick one. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sergeant Mazak, 3rd Medcom, uh, Army Reserve. I... Uh, I'm curious if you have any best practices or feedback for when you're dealing with a leader who um, gives good lip service, says all the right things in terms of inclusion and diversity, but you just know they're not there. How do you keep the people within that organization who are motivated and who do desire all that engaged and not burned out? Simple answer to that, I don't think you have a leader. You know, uh, Or if, if someone's not willing to open their eyes and professionally develop and take on that mission, then they can go lead the motor pool or they can go lead a piece of equipment because I got no use for them. I understand. I understand your constraints. Um, that's why I get made, paid the big bucks. That's why you get paid the big bucks. I know, I know you can't move them out right away. That ought to be part of the career progression in any organization. You know, if, you can't, if you can't live those values, I got no use for you. I got no use for you. It might be a while before we, we figure something out. Um, and in the interim, I'll give, you the, I'll give you the opportunity to reassess your values and at least how you might communicate them. But otherwise, we just don't have much to converse about. Not, not you and me, we can talk all day. I think you're awesome. But, but you know, this hypothetical leader we got. Yeah. But that might not be the answer you're looking for, but I, maybe I'm too simplistic about it, but uh, I'm just trying to, trying to be straight. I think I'm getting yanked. I think the cane is hitting me here, folks. Thank you very much for all your energy. I much appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Griffith.
And as he mentioned, we will hear from Dr. Griffith again uh, a bit later this afternoon. Right now, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and that will be followed by today's panel discussion. If the panel members could come to the stage here, that would be terrific. Thank you.